it's Russell Todd from the films Friday the 13th Part 2, Shopping Mall, He Knows You're Alone, and Sweet Murder. And you're listening to The Movie Raid. It's time for The Movie Raid, and tonight's victim is Russell Todd. That's played in Friday the 13th Part 2, Chopping Mall, He Knows You're Alone, and many more. Hey, Mike, how are you? What are you doing? I'm doing great. I like that you said tonight's victim. <laughs> That's great. As they all are, indeed. <laughs> Sometimes I redig them up. Hey, it's good to be here, and I really appreciate you asking me to, to be part of your show. You are a former actor, if, if that is correct. That is correct. I was, I was actually acting since I was um, about 19 years old. I started doing stuff, but I started get doing these horror pictures, outside, and, and other things as well. But i got to tell you, the most fun were the horror pictures, because they're just, they're just a hoot to do, and, and, and the fans just love them, and they never, never forget them, which is great. The first one um, was something called He Knows You're Alone, which I think, and you, you should check, you maybe you can check this, it was Tom Hanks' first film. And whatever happened to Tom? Nothing. Never had a career. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, he was there? Okay, move on. <laughs> <laughs> so in that one, I played this guy on a date. It's our first night out, and we're in the back of a car making out, and suddenly she hears something outside. I go, it's nothing, it's nothing. And she goes, no, go check, go check. So I go out and check, and she hears nothing, and then suddenly she hears a tapping on the roof of the car, and she comes out, and I'm hanging upside down with a slip throat, and my ring is hitting the side of the car, and she screams, and then a killer comes, and then you see someone else scream, and you realize that we're a movie within a movie theater that these other people are watching, and it's about brides getting killed on their wedding night. Did yeah. you ever see that one? Uh, I vaguely remember, but I'm pretty sure I have at one point. Yeah, most people have not, but, <laughs> 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 but it's still out there, and occasionally it services on TV, which is funny. Um, but yeah, but, but uh, what's funny is I died almost the same way in uh, Friday the 13th Part 2, because as you know, you know, I, I'm chasing this girl, she's skinny dipping, I, I run with her clothing, I get flipped upside down in this bear trap, and then Jason comes and slits my throat, and, and then the girl finds me hanging upside down, so uh, I guess they uh, thought I could play that part well, hanging upside down with a slit throat, I don't know. <laughs> How well can we make this guy bleed? Uh, yeah, that looks great, great. <laughs> the funny part is, you know, they cut the scene before it got too bloody, in Friday the 13th Part 2. Yeah, so at that time, it's like, when it comes to gore, they always had to trim it down just to get that rating uh, for the film. I think so, you're, you're right. You're definitely right. Because, you know, there was, I was upside down, and I had a prosthetic piece you know, of uh, foam on my neck that was pre-cut and had blood in it. And there was tubing there going up my shirt, up my leg, out my shoe, to a guy above me in the tree who had a canister full of blood. He would pump it once Jason slit my throat, and it would come out. So when Jason slipped my throat with a machete, he put it against there and pulled back. It was pre-cut, like I said. So all I had to do was lean my head back as he slid the night, and it opened up, and the guy started pumping the blood. Well, that blood started flowing like crazy, and it was like going into my eyes. It was just, it was, just, it was a mess. It was a mess. It was too much. So they had to cut, and eventually, you know, uh, they had to let me down anyway because I was upside down for about three hours prepping that shot. <laughs> But uh, it was a fun afternoon. You know, it's funny, that before he did that shot, I remember they did that shot on the last day of my shooting schedule. We were in Kent, Connecticut, when I was living in New York City. And my parents called me and said, why are they saving your death scene for the last scene of your work? What, why are they doing this? I said, what do you mean? They go, well, is this a stuff movie? Are they going to really kill you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, Ma, no, Dad. This is Paramount Studios. I don't think they're going to kill me uh, making the movie. No. No, but that would be a hell of a good way to go. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this thing better make money while I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many people Jason has, has killed in all of those movies. Do you know the total? Oh, God. I, I, I know it's probably... Uh, well, I mean, there's a stats on J Freddy versus Jason. We can compare the two. Right, yeah. I mean, uh, not counting the remake, of course. Right. Right. You know, I haven't seen um, all of the Jason films, though, unfortunately. You know, I, I, I saw three or four of them, but I just got so busy, I didn't get a chance to see them all. But i got to catch them all and see, because I know some other people in some of them, and it's fun to watch them. Yeah, I mean, they're like for the first two definitely brings out the story. A lot, of, a lot of people don't like the Jason Voorhees character because they compare it to Michael Myers because of the way he acts. Well, there's, there's a diff, big difference between the two. The reason why is because Jason Voorhees has an actual motive. A real motive why he kills. Right. The reason why he kills is because his mother tells him to. And even though, uh, if you haven't seen Friday the 13th, big spoiler, uh, the mother gets killed. And the reason why is uh, the mother has 
made some voodoo uh, to bring Jason Voorhees back, which uh, I believe that's shown in the second film. The, the girl goes into her cabin, finds this black book, and it burns up. Right. And that's the that's the book that brings Jason back to life, if I got that correct. Yeah. And that's why you see Jason, because he thinks anyone that enters in Crystal Lake in general, he thinks that's the the, the people that neglected, that let him drown. When he was a camper. Yeah. yeah, when he was a camper, when he was a little kid. And that's what he does. He, he kills anybody, and it doesn't matter who he is, who they are. He kills. He just kills anybody. And that's that's the great part about it. He doesn't give a shit. <laughs> yeah, I know he does. In fact, you know, as we're talking, I pulled it up on the internet. How many people did Jason Voorhees kill? 154 from the first Friday the 13th to Freddy versus Jason. Yeah, I knew it was in the hundreds. I just couldn't give you an accurate number. It's like I thought it was like 100, about 30, 40 or so. And I, said, I know it was a lot. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's a character. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, when we were making that movie, we were at this real actual camp in Kent, Connecticut. And where the, um, the lodge was, where a lot of the stuff took place and a lot of the killings, it was, a, it was a long walk on this dark, dark path with tall trees on both sides back to the actual cabins where we were staying. So when you would wrap and, you know, there's still shooting going on and you'd go back after your scenes were done, when you would walk along there, there would always be some crew member standing in the bushes, you know, going, cow, 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 cow. Yeah, that was another little thing that people thought, like, when you listened to it, uh, they thought, they kept saying, kick, 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 kick. No, it's, it's supposed to say, kill, 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 mama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but a lot of people go. I was like, "What the hell's that?" <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when it comes to that, uh, it seems real prop blood and stuff like that. It, it seems like it's it's really starting to slow down completely. Now they're not even using it anymore. Yeah, I guess you know a lot of regulations and stuff. But then you look at some of these films, like the Saw pictures and stuff. They're just so disgusting. You know, <laughs> the, 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 the way they they uh, decide someone will die in them. It's really really scary. I, I don't agree with the. Uh, some of the series i did see every single one of them but i don't agree with some of the sequels but uh the first one definitely put a little bit of a twist on as far as the newcomer films at that time right yeah. and i thought it was tobin bell's character was excellent i thought he did perfect on that on that film oh that's great yeah yeah. Bobby, uh, yeah, there, no, there's the whole, and uh, I've said this before in a previous interview, uh, the, the whole torture porn thing's going on. It's like where there's no motive, it's just senseless oh, know, killing. It's, it's like it just it makes no sense. And again, we go back to the Friday the 13th, I'm sure people are like, yeah, that's what he does. Well, not really. I mean, like I said, he's got a motive. Right. But people always say, well, why the hell did you go back to that camp? You know, all those kids were killed there. What are we doing there? Yeah, because no one believes it believes the story no matter what. Oh, no, there's no killer there. It's, just, it's, it's been silent for like eight years, and they go back there and still get killed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> have sex. That's that's the whole point of it. You have sex, you die. That's, that's, that's it. Right. You know, that, that's so funny you said that. I always tell that to people when they ask me about it. Go, that, that's the moral of all these films. You have sex, you die. <laughs> it's a little old-fashioned. But uh, it's funny that they still think that. Uh, that's the good old times, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> ah, memories. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but uh, you yeah, always have good times with Friday Thirteenth, you know. That, uh, uh, if Friday Thirteenth, yeah, if Friday Thirteenth was not great, it wouldn't be playing on uh, networks on Halloween every year. Oh yeah, it just keeps going. It'll go go in perpetuity forever, you know. And it's fun. I still see residual checks that come from Paramount every year, and uh, it's been so many years since it made it. And um, occasionally I run into some of the people at, at a fan convention, uh, you know, some of the other actors, or in Los Angeles here, sometimes I, I run into somebody, so it's, it's fun, it's, it's, a, it's a nice part of history. Would you actually wanted to uh, change your character in some way in Friday the 13th, or were you pretty satisfied of where you were at? Uh, no, I liked it when I did it. I, you know, I thought he was, you know, kind of a little smart-ass, and, and you know, womanizer, and, and uh, it was kind of cool. Um, I might have played him, you know, I might have made him a little a little tougher than than he was but um right i thought it was good it was it was fine the way it was written and no complaints oh well, there you go you ever thought what, what would you have done different mm, no I, i'm pretty satisfied the way it is because uh the death look is pretty decent because uh that's what that's what he does he likes to trick people like that and just scares the hell out of them and i, I thought it was fairly decent oh uh, good that's good I wouldn't change anything, not really. Uh, one thing I would have changed, I would have died later in the movie. <laughs> yeah, it's like, can it be at like the last scene or something? Uh, fact, <laughs> I want to survive into the next one. <laughs> yeah, it's like, just you know, survive just a little long. my death and a few other deaths from part two, and I think in part four, it opened with some 
previous deaths from previous films, and they used mine. I had seen that one, so I saw that, and I never saw, you know, if they take your clip and they use it in another film, you're supposed to get residual from it. So I never saw anything, so I called the Screen Actors Guild, I said, are we supposed to get residuals for this? And they go, oh, yeah, you are. So, but we have to contact Paramount. So they, she, they said, contact Paramount. So I, I actually called them, and they said, we're not even in it. I said, uh, I think you better take a look at it again, because I die, you know, for a, for a few seconds in the, begin, in the beginning of part four, because you lifted it from part two. They said, no, prove it. Prove it? Look at the damn film yourself. <laughs> they did not want to say yes and have to pay residuals backwards for all those years that they didn't admit. Or I don't think they paid anyone that they lifted people's deaths and put it in part four that they wanted to pay anyone. So we had to send them time codes, all sorts of crap, to make them pay. And eventually they did. But uh, I don't know why a company that large would, would have such an issue with it, but they did. That seems the biggest problem even today is like, uh, even if it's an old franchise, if anything, even if it's a TV show, like uh, even with Happy Days. The Happy Days had a problem with that because uh, Tom Boysley, who plays Howard Conan, died, and then uh, they made all these uh, commercials and uh, products and everything that was related to Happy Days, and a lot of the, the cast members didn't get anything. Right, that's and, very true, yeah. Studios are tough with residuals. I mean, to Paramount's credit, they paid it. You know, they were terrific, and they're always great about paying, uh, you know, the regular one on Friday the 13th Part 2. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I can't even imagine, you know, the size of a department that has to take residuals for every single show, every single time it runs, TV and film for a studio. It must be just gigantic, crazy. Even even for photography, even just a picture of, yeah. of, your, of your body. It's like, there you go, There there's like uh, 10 bucks right there, thanks. Yeah. You know? you know, I used to do a soap opera, Another World, in New York. I played Dr. Jamie Frame for three years. And when I was off the show, I was in the main family of the show, and my picture was in the living room on the piano of this house. So even when I'm off the show, a year or two years later, I'm getting residuals because they have to pay you every time, they, like you said, they see that picture of, of me sitting there. And I think, wow, this is crazy, but, but terrific. Yeah, that's how it should be, man. Uh, and you th- because it's your work either way. Even if you're not in- no longer involved with this project and you're in there some form of matter, you still deserve some kind of compensation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. But it gets rough when it comes to that. Even Like I said, back with uh, big franchises like that, even if you're the smallest character, even if you died at the very beginning, even before the credits roll, <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, yeah, here's a couple bucks just to shut you up. Yeah, they have to they have to contractually, but uh, yeah. Why uh, why exactly did you uh, stop acting? Because uh, you you have a new company going on. I do, yeah. Well, I stopped acting after I did the soap opera. After I did Another World, you know, I, I came back. I did three years on that show, and you know, for any actor, it's a blessing to have long term work. And I did. I had three years as a character on an NBC soap opera, which I'm very very grateful for. But it's not something I really enjoy. You know, working fifty weeks a year as an actor doing the same character. And all I enjoyed before that, jumping around, playing this character, doing this commercial, doing that MOW, doing this TV show, you know, playing, even if it wasn't full-time on those shows, I, that's what I really preferred. And that kind of took some of the love of acting uh, out of me. So when I came back, I just kind of, um, you know, started doing more commercials. And in fact, I did one with Sharon Stone, which was never really seen here in the States, but you can catch it on um, YouTube if you just Google Sharon Stone and the word scotch. And it's a really cool commercial black and white that showed, I believe, in Japan and Europe, something called William Lawson Scotch. But uh, and then I was just, you know, I had an opportunity. I was on a commercial audition, and I ran into a friend of mine who was uh, manning the camera at the uh, commercial audition. He said, well, you know, I'm leaving here, and I'm going to work for this below-the-line agency, and I'll be repping DPs and production designers, costumers, editors, and, and they're looking for someone in the TV department there. And I said, well, I don't know. But I said, I'll go meet them. So I met them, and I really liked the woman who owned the company. She was really dynamic and she owned, she was Canadian, uh, Canadian, I think she owned a hockey team in Canada, and she was really cool. I said, all right, I'll try this out. So I started working there. And um, one day, some a guy walked in and said, do you guys represent Steadicam operators? And I said, well, you know, let me get back to you. And, and I started the first division of Steadicam operators in any major agency right after that. And I, you know, I found 10 guys that wanted to be repped, because I don't think they were being repped back then. And, um, and it grew from there. And then I stayed there for a few years, and then I left with my clients, and then uh, I added another uh, 30 or 40 people, and I have almost 50 guys all around the country. Nice. Yeah, and I love it, and they make all, you know, almost every major movie, TV show, commercial, music video, documentaries, they're in, they you know, work on all of those kinds of projects. It's really interesting, I've got a lot of respect for them for what they do. It's hard, hard work. Yeah, they they are an important piece of the puzzle, considering, you, of course, the actors, and you got directors and writers, but you got the camera guy, and a lot of people will say, oh, you're just the camera guy. Well, it may be just the camera guy, but you have to do it well. 
Exactly, and they really vary. I mean, you know, there are camera guys that are good, and there are camera guys that are just amazing. I think all my guys are amazing. But, um, but you know, out there, you know, who's available, there, it really is, you know, it really varies as far as talent. And uh, it makes a big difference. You know how much the camera and the movement of the camera, you know, sets a scene and a tone and a pace. That's really important to a, to a, to a project. Yeah, it, it has to fit the film, uh, the way it's moved, not shake the camera when it doesn't need to be shaken because if you're just shaking the camera, well, you're not really doing what you're supposed to do. You're just kind of screwed. It's like a, it's like an actor or a, a crew member accidentally goes into the scene by mistake, you know? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Very true. Very true. And it's cool to go and watch. I don't know if you ever go to sets, but when I go to watch some of my clients, I'm always amazed by what they do and, and how it's all put together. Even having been in it as an actor... I'm still, you know, always just thrilled to to see how productions are, are made. You ever thought about doing a film yourself using your camera guys? Well, I mean, like producing it or what? Yeah. Uh, not really, not really. You know, once I wanted to be a director, I went to film school. I always wanted to be a director. And um, and then I got sidetracked into the acting, which I stayed in for many, many years, and now this. So, uh, no, I'm really, really happy where I am right now. You know, I, I don't have to wake up in the morning and care what I look like anymore, <laughs> which all <laughs> actors do. And, um, you know, it's, what I do is still very creative. I love the deal-making. I love the deal process. And, uh and I'm just as excited for my clients as they are when you know I book something for them and uh, and they go to get to go off and do it. Especially when these guys, you know, like even when I was an actor, I would go to Germany, I would go to uh, Australia to do something. You know, it's a great way to see the world what someone else is paying, no matter what industry you're in. But you know, my clients go all over the world to to shoot films and and, and other projects, and how great for them, you know, what an experience. Yeah, it's almost like you're there even though you're not there, but you're from you're from a chair, but you're you're doing your part to helping them out so that they uh, they get recognition uh, as well as you do. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and, and they're very grateful for it, which is nice, and, and I'm very grateful that, that they're here at my agency, so it's all good. It's all good. So no producing for me. I'm really happy with this. I'm sure this is what will take me uh, into my retirement someday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I'm loving it. And, you know, it's great to look back at all those things. Like uh, that other one um, you and I were talking about earlier, Chopping Mall, uh, Jim Wynorski film that just got re-released in a brand-new 35-millimeter widescreen print, which is going to be re-released around the country. And uh, Tony O'Dell and Kelly Maroney are in that as well. And uh, it's a fun film. Um, Roger Corman and Julie Corman produced it. I forget what year we did that. but uh, uh, I know it was like in 1980. Uh, somewhere around there, yeah. 80, 86, oh god, I can't remember. <laughs> but I know it's in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely in the 80s. But uh, a lot of fun to make that. Uh, actually, it was 86. 86. Ah, okay. And yeah. uh, we shot it at a place, there's a, there's a very famous mall here called the Sherman Oaks Galleria. Then it was all a bunch of stores, I think it was three levels, and um, now it's mostly, it's, you know, there's an arc like movie theater there now, and, and, and a lot of um, offices. We used to be a three-level uh, uh, shopping mall. And we would go in there from like 8 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning with guns and crowbars, and we, you know, we were being chased by these killer robots that were guarding the mall at night in the movie. Mm. Destroyed the place. You know, we were knocking down windows and shooting things up, and as, as a young guy, that was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. So much fun. And it was great working with Jim Minorski and the other uh, actors on there. And um, yeah, I'm really glad that they're, that they're re-released it, they remastered it, colored it, uh, worked on the color, and uh, it's coming out again. Yeah, I love the fact that they're finally doing this, uh, re-releasing on these pictures, because uh, a lot of these are just, they're gone, they disappeared, no one's ever seen these ever again, or let alone even heard of the title anymore. Yeah, it's very true, it's sad, you know, I mean, occasionally stuff pops up, you see like in the uh, in the old um, video cassette bin at some store for two bucks. I know, it makes you feel really old, don't it? And it's like, oh wow, I remember this in the old days, oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. It almost it's almost kinda sad in a way it's like, damn <laughs> I still got it on VHS. Really? <laughs> Someone please buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's only five ninety nine now. Would you believe like uh the Puppet Master where it's got all nine films on two discs, only five bucks? <laughs> <laughs> Did they really do that? No. Yeah. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Didn't you get every Friday the thirteenth ever made on one one D V D for three bucks? Oh yeah! Oh no, that's like sixty dollars <laughs> <laughs> with a keychain. Really? With a keychain, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh man, but it with I love old school horror films. So uh, now these days, uh, you got your high class ones where you got technology it's so advanced, uh, when, when makes it look a uh, little bit better, I would say. But it doesn't feel the old way. Yeah, yeah, and no, there's definitely feels of the older ones without a doubt. Well, now, yeah, I mean, but the effects now are just amazing. I mean, they, you can do anything in a movie. Oh yeah, anything. Which is incredible. I mean, it makes a big difference. But there's still something to be said for the old, the old ones that. Um, were, uh, they were done very differently, but they were very effective. Yeah, it's, it's, it was believable, too, because uh, it's like, oh, my God, look at all blood. And it's like maybe the blood looked, looked fake back then, but it looked like the dude got decapitated. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, you see the dude's head rolling down there, and it looks like a head. I mean, if you, if you don't freeze frame it, of course, but it looks like some dude's head going at it. It's like a uh, look at, like, the omen, you know, when that dude gets his head chopped off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, compared to that, it's like uh, they. I'm sure now they just want to cut down on money, but and just use the uh, the whole CGI. But uh, uh, it's. I think it's best. Do you think it's best uh, for old school to be purely old school, or do you think you think uh, it's better to have the new effects? I think both work, but I think when I watch up in old school, I, I enjoy it more because the way it was done. Now you know, so much of it is just you know special effects. Really, you know, amazing computer generated special effects. It's very different, and you know it. But it's still very effective. I mean, it, you, you couldn't do the things they do now back then, and um, and it's you can't achieve some of the results, obviously. And and, and and there are great things being done now. But I still like the old world, and um, I think simpler sometimes is better. Not you know, fancy isn't always the best. Well, how, how do you think about horror films today? Do you think it's advanced better, or do you think it's kind of gone downhill a little bit as far as the story or or the effects of of the film itself? Well, as I say, I think you know, the others they're they're Good and bad to today's uh, and uh, and comparison. Um, I like a lot of what they're doing now, but I also like the simplicity of what they used to do, and it was just just as effective. You know, well, back then when you're watching, you didn't know that you know the things they're doing now couldn't have been achieved back then, so you had nothing to compare it to, of course. But it, it worked. I mean, how many times did you scream in the movie theater and you weren't thinking, "Oh wow, they could have done that better"? Well, sometimes you do say they could have done that better. I'm wrong yeah. about that. But um, you know, we were very happy with the way horror films were made, and 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 if they weren't done well, it was even funnier sometimes and kitschier because you said, "Oh wow, look at that!" You know. Hey, do you remember there used to be a, a, a gothic soap opera on years ago called Dark Shadows, and it, and it was about a vampire, Barnabas Collins, and you know, it was a TV show, and the camera would bump into the walls, the boom mic would show up every time, and people kept watching it because you couldn't stop watching all the all the stuff that was going wrong, and love that too so you know you never know what makes something work or doesn't work yeah but now it seems kind of rushed like you see horror film and horror film horror film now and it just seems rushed because it seems they they just put all this money basically for the new high-tech stuff but there's like no story to half of them yeah a lot of things don't have a story they're more concerned about we can we can we can create this effect which uh is all they care about but um they can. They all of a sudden there's like we can add this much gore and this much gore and this much gore. Uh, how about some more gore? Yeah, yeah. No. Oh, it's really, really over the top with gore now. I think. Yeah. No, it's just it, uh, I don't feel the story anymore. Like Happy Spoons. I rarely ever buy any of the newer films on DVD anymore. Mm-hmm. It's like very rarely. It's like it, it, it's not appealing, man. It's, yeah, well, it's, you gotta have a story. If you don't have a story, you really don't have anything. You know. You can do, do great effects, but you you, you want to feel for the people first of all. Yeah, it, it's all about uh, the the what, the the viewers, how they're going to react to it. And ten so it's like uh, probably what um, probably f- between six, maybe nine out of ten. Uh, a lot of, a lot of times it doesn't go very well. Yeah, like box office especially, and yeah, you know, it's like uh, direct to DVD. It's like that's a that's not entirely a good thing when they say direct to, right. to DVD. Is like why? Well, yeah, because it probably didn't go very well at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, these, a lot of these films are made for very, very little, and, uh, you know, if they do well at the box office, they don't have to do too well to actually make a profit, of course. Yeah, it's all about that. Yeah. But uh, well, let's go back to your company again. Uh, go ahead and promote that again uh, as far as, because, like I said, this seems like a, a very rare type type deal that uh, you really want to push forward. Well, thanks, Mike. Yeah, it's called Russell Todd Agency. That way, uh, when I get up in the morning, I can remember where I work. <laughs> and, um it's, uh, it, we just represent Steadicam and camera operators all around the country and, and some other foreign countries. And again, we, uh, they get employed by some of the best cinematographers and most well-known cinematographers in the world and, uh, and do some of the best well-known movies in the world and, and TV shows uh, all over. And um, it's a very cool niche because there, I don't think there's another agency that's just specifically representing Steadicam operators. I know there's some other agents, agencies that represent a couple of them but this is the only one that is, is specifically geared for that and um, and probably the largest in the world. So uh, it's great.
great. I love getting up every day. I love uh, getting to work and, and negotiating for them. I've had make, made some great relationships in the last 14 years in this business. So people know to to call here when they're looking for a steady cam operator. Yeah, I'm very blessed in that regard. I, I love what I do, and I you know I don't care who you are, what industry you're in, how much money you make. If you're not happy doing what you're doing, you know if you can get out and do something you love, that is true success. And um, I feel I'm like I said, I'm very blessed that I'm doing something that I love here. Uh, definitely, because you can definitely relate to the people the of the agency that you're that you're doing because you yourself has been in that kind of predicament in a different form. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know what it's like what, trying to struggle to get where you where you need to. And even though maybe not acting wise, but at least you can do some part to further help others with, with, with what you're doing in a different way. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, and I'm still in the business. You know, I'm still in the entertainment business, which is great. It's a business I love, and I've always wanted to be in it. And uh, you never know where it'll take you. You know, where what what changes. And before I was in front of the camera, now I'm behind it, and I'm just as happy, if not happier. Uh, so it's all good. And I get to do this, these great interviews with guys like you that, uh, that bring back great memories of, uh, of the acting days. You're making new ones. That's right. Hopefully every day. You said it. Every day. Big or small, man. We're always going to remember it. Because even if it's the smallest thing, you're making a big deal out of it. And that is Russell Todd, a former actor, uh, Friday the 13th Part 2, as well, uh, you know, everything. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that works.